Hi, it's Hope Cook here with Dermcast Live. Today I have James Worry. James is back in our studio. He's a physician assistant who works in dermatology and dermatologic surgery. He's practiced since 2011. James also has his doctorate of health sciences. Welcome, James. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. I can't wait to talk about dermatologic surgery because that's something that a lot of us want to know more about, but it seems elusive. Yeah, the last time I was here, remember, we talked about rashes in pregnant women. Yes. This doesn't happen quite as much as surgery, so I'm happy to bring a practical lecture uh, to the medium today. Yes, and um, you gave some really good tips, just very practical tips in your lecture today. So I've been doing this for a while now, Hope, and I've learned over time uh, the way that things tend to work better, the practical approach to things, and I really tried to share that with the audience today. Yes, I love how you um, talked about what not to do, like, you know. Over time, I think we learn what not to do, uh -huh. uh, more so than, you know, what we are doing or supposed to do. So I like to try to realize whenever we have a patient that may not be the perfect fit for surgery with us or if someone needs to be referred, and setting that up appropriately helps to ensure that you have a successful mm -hmm. outcome. And one of the biggest things you said is the location, like not screwing up the location. How do you ensure that that's um, taken care of at your office? Right, location, uh, location, location, <laughs> real estate, and Durham too, I suppose. Um, so I think number one is if you're taking biopsies, don't take too many biopsies. Two biopsies, really, three at the most. You don't need four, five, or six. And you want to make sure that you're very specific with labeling mm -hmm. them. So we're going to label our bottles, our specimen containers immediately with the patient's name, date of birth, um, and the location. And when we pick our locations, very specific with anatomical mm -hmm. landmarks, with measurements, photographs, you have to really document well because if you take two or three biopsies, one of those comes back as say a severely dysplastic nevus, it's going to need some more work. Mm -hmm. Which one is it? You better make sure that you know mm -hmm. which one you're going after. And I like how you have patients take a selfie. So everybody likes selfies. Everyone, <laughs> you know, even older folks, they have cell phones and uh, smartphones. Um, so you think if you do a little shade biopsy on the mm -hmm. nose and it might be a month or two months to see most surgery, that's going to heal over yeah. really quickly. So a quick selfie, even if your EMR in the office isn't the greatest for photos, everyone can take a selfie at home of the spot. And mm -hmm. it really is helpful in identifying the proper surgical site. Yeah. That's so true. And once the patient comes in for surgery, you mentioned the triple A's. Can you tell our audience what the triple A's Yes, involves? so we want to know the patient um, allergies. We want to know if the patient has a bad attitude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm forgetting my third A. What's my third A? <laughs> Was it anesthesia? Anesthesia, yeah. So we want to know. So does the patient have any allergies to the anesthesia? Uh, what is the patient's attitude? If the patient has a bad attitude, they're not happy with the procedure that's supposed to be done, they're not happy with you doing the procedure, the best outcome is probably not going to occur. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are things to take in as you're preparing the patient history, and that sets you up for a successful encounter. And anxiety, I forgot that one. Patient anxiety, people get really worked up over surgery, over needles, over sutures. Um, so you wanna talk them through it. You wanna let them know what's gonna happen, that they're gonna expect a little sting and burn with the injection of the lidocaine, mm -hmm. and if you prepare them, I think they handle it better. Yeah, because some patients hear surgery and they picture, you know, being sedated yes. with the mask and the Can I drive can home? Can yeah. Who has to bring me? You know, so I let them know this is going to take five or ten minutes. It's not a big deal. You can bring yourself and you'll be fine. Yeah. Do you do anything else for their anxiety, like have them, you know, the option of listening to music or? Patients sometimes bring headphones to listen to music. I think I play really good music in the <laughs> office where I always have a nice 80s mix or something going yeah. on. So I have music and little jokes and we talk about it. Um, most of the time we just talk through the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And then, okay, so they were at the point where they're having the surgery and then when they're finished, what do you do to make sure they do proper wound care? During the surgery to kind of pass time and while I'm working, I will tell them, hey, you're going to have stitches here, no heavy lifting, leave this bandage on for the first mm -hmm. 24 hours, whatever. And then the nurse also will reinforce this. When I'm done with surgery, I say, okay, well, we're all done. I'm going to go work on your chart. The mm -hmm. nurse is going to bandage up and tell you how to care for this. And we finally, we send patients home with wound care directions. Now, as we know, whether or not they read that is something yeah. totally different, but we give them everything that they need. We give them wound care and we tell them that they can call us. And I think if they know over the weekend that they can call you and they have your number, 
it really takes away that fear and mm -hmm. most of the time then they don't call you. Okay. So I think telling them they can call you actually prevents phone calls in the long run. I think you're right. And so many providers are probably nervous about putting their cell phone on there. Well, I certainly wouldn't put my cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I do put my office number yeah. <laughs> and let the answer service gotcha. fill that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And any tips for PAs, especially like uh, providers who are just starting to do surgery, like body parts to watch out for? Yeah, sure. At the end of my lecture, it was so amazing. A group of, uh, there were a line of people to ask me questions. And one um, newer nurse practitioner said, hey, I'm new to uh, dermatology and I want to start to do surgeries. What are your suggestions? And um, you know, the first is we start on the simulated skin or the sim skin. Mm -hmm. You can get on Amazon and they have suture and everything that you need. Oh, wow. You can practice there. Much fancier than the pig's feed that we had or the piece of chicken. Um, <laughs> and then I say you start out with some simple things like punch biopsies that mm -hmm. are going to need a simple repair, um, little procedures on the back or the arm. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, older folks. Older yes. folks are the best ones to practice suturing on. They tend to be a little bit more relaxed about the concerns of mm -hmm. scarring. Their skin is lax and it gives easily. So start with small things, start with older folks, start in non-sensitive areas. Mm -hmm. And as you build your skill, you can move to these more complex or more visual areas. Um, and work with your colleagues who have been doing this for a little while. Mm -hmm. You can see uh, seeing suturing techniques up close and personal firsthand yes. is really important. It's hard to visualize in a book sometimes but seeing mm -hmm. it and learning from your attendings and your colleagues is very helpful. I think so too. When I learned to do surgery, I would stand behind my mm -hmm. supervising physician and move my hands. Looking over the shoulders, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, older patients have that lax skin. They're perfect. You can do a big surgery on them and they come out looking great. Yeah. Any um, particular nerves or blood vessels that you're like, oh, stay away from that? Yeah, so the one spot that I really think is important, uh, and for me that even makes me a little bit mm -hmm. like, oh boy, I better be careful, is what we called herb point. And we learned herbs point in the lecture as being kind of here along the sternocleidomastoid. Mm -hmm. um, and the spinal accessory nerve transverses very superficially here. So of course disruption to that could result in a winged scapula. Bad news. Bad news, right? Just a hard thing to explain to the boss. Um, <laughs> so this is an area where I do try to avoid. On the face, you know, we know there might be some increased bleeding mm -hmm. on vascularity, but that also makes it heal so well. So mm -hmm. um, I'd say when your skill level is there, don't be afraid of those things, but be aware of those things. Mm -hmm. Any tips to reduce scarring? Yeah, and folks where we know that they might have hypertrophic scars or keloids are prone to this, one trick that I really like is to inject steroids at the time of surgery okay. and then also at the suture removal. Wow, what dose? Uh, it'll depend on the area. Face, I might go around five, trunk okay. 10, definitely chest 10, you know, yeah. analog interlesionally. That's a good tip. Great. Steri strips, um, silicone sheets afterwards, or silicone mm -hmm. gels, sunscreen, the basic things. Um, but in really prone uh, keloid formers, I think steroids interoperatively is the way to go. And mm -hmm. when I excise, keloids in those people. I inject steroids intraoperatively with beautiful results. Okay. And you also have to pay attention to what type of suture you're using and the location. Can you say more about that? Yeah, you know, first of all, there are some people who are allergic to suture and the old fashioned gut mm -hmm. suture elicits the greatest response in mm -hmm. the most number of people. Um, but there are people who have true suture allergies and it's typically the buried sub Q sutures. Mm -hmm. So we have to be aware of that. Maybe we can go without them or if we do um, need sub-Q sutures and this is a reactive person, we'll try to use monofilaments, one strand mm -hmm. instead of braided. Braided can harbor bacteria and cause more inflammation. Okay. Um, and sometimes, again, this might be an area where we would use some steroids to try to blunt that mm -hmm. inflammatory response. So in people who might have allergies, keep it as simple as you can. Mm -hmm. And then you consider the area you're working on. Delicate spots, we want something like a 5-0 or a 6-0, a more okay. fine delicate uh, strand of suture. Mm -hmm. Areas under tension, like the back or a muscle, probably 3-0. Yeah, and that's more the fishing twine. <laughs> that's <laughs> like. the hardcore, right, exactly. The, the twine, the thread, like you said. Um, but you need that muscle sometimes in those areas that are prone to pulling mm -hmm. or dehiscent. So when you see a patient who's had surgery years ago and they have the railroad tracks, like what caused that or what can you do yeah, to prevent this that? This is telling us that this was, there was probably too much tension on okay. the superficial sutures. So those deep buried sutures 
whether they're simple interrupted, mm -hmm. their mattresses, they should really absorb all of that tension. And the superficial layers of the skin should not be under tension mm -hmm. at all, to the point that we're just putting in these simple or running cutaneous sutures on the surface uh, for reinforcement. They're really not doing the work. The sub -Q should do the work. So that tells me there was a lot of tension on the surface of the skin. Okay, that makes so much sense. The railroad track is classic though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other tips for providers who are doing dermatologic surgery in their office? Most people can perform surgery to some level. Uh -huh. um, I think that there are some providers who are afraid to do any type of procedure or surgery. You have to be comfortable, but mm. you should get comfortable with simple things, punch excisions, uh, little INDs, and if you want to, and you feel that you have the skill and the hands mm -hmm. for that, go ahead and progress, and you'll be surprised what you can do. Um, and as long as you're comfortable and your attendings are comfortable with it and the patient is comfortable, the outcomes are good and you're increasing a patient's access to care and they're not waiting six mm -hmm. months, six weeks, six whatever days. They're getting it done right away. They're not walking around with this dysplastic mole. You're actually helping more people. Mm -hmm. So fine tune your skills. If it's something you like, continue to keep at it and you can do a really nice job and help people too. Yeah, great advice. Thanks, Thanks so much, James, for joining us I'm today. I'm glad to be back. Thank you. This is Hope Cook, Dermcast Live in Austin, Texas.